it was so obvious that what was happening literally in the chapter, which was what was happening for me in that very moment. Hmm. And it was like, you, you, I, I didn't even doubt it. What if story is the answer to our crises of meaning and belonging, to our impulse to heal our lives and help others, to our desire and drive to leave this world better than we found it. Now we love good stories. In fact, we're kind of obsessed, not just with the stories themselves, but with the stories behind the stories. Their oddly perfect timing, the healing process they provoke in their authors, and their capacity to catalyze individual and collective change. And we love exploring these with writers, thought leaders, entrepreneurs, healers, parents, and others. Tune in to hear these stories behind the stories and entertain with us the real possibility that whether you are a teller or a consumer, story is always offering or leading us to an answer. When she sold her business, Dr. Carlin Pleasance knew she wasn't done. There was more for her to do to share the wisdom that she had gleaned in her 25 years of developing therapeutic community programs for individuals with complex mental illnesses. But what? Tune in to hear how Carlin discovered that writing fiction could be her next powerful way to change the paradigms of care and mental health. How she decided to blend her expertise with her love of legend and synchronicity into an unforgettable journey that demonstrates the power of curiosity, truth telling, and love. And how she navigated a serious case of writer's block and later realized that she had actually been healing a story that she didn't even know existed. It's time to grab a cup of something delicious and enjoy these sips of story insanity with us. Ready? Sure. Oh, good. We're recording anyway. Perfect. Okay. (laughs) Welcome. Welcome to Sips of Story Insanity, where we talk about the stories behind the stories with authors, speakers, creatives, and thought leaders. My team, son, Aaron. Hello. My sister, Alyssa. Hi. And clients turned friends turned team members, Teddy. Hey, y'all. And Lori. Hi, everyone. They're all here to help me make sure that we get the most yummy sips out of our experience today. And it's going to be so fun because we actually have a new team member and a new client turned friend turned team member joining joining the group Uh, today. Dr. Carlin Pleasant is a wildly intuitive human, true story, who applies her superpowers to helping other humans sort themselves out and heal. She delights in synchronicity and the magic of how the universe orchestrates those meant to meet and finding one another. Wait till you hear how we met. She is all about connection and belonging. As a clinical psychologist, she has spent the past 25 years helping therapeutic community programs for individuals with complex mental illnesses and has experienced firsthand the healing transformation possible when people are accepted and welcomed into a group that believes in their ability to recover, thrive, and find purpose in life. She is also the author of a novel due for release this summer called Feathers from the Fire, a story about transcending the trappings of fear and stigma and following the call to find meaning and purpose and the importance of having supportive allies to help guide the way. Welcome, Carlin. Thank you. Hi. Oh, man, we really do have to start at the beginning because, you know, you are all about the magic and the synchronicity and the intersection of uh, what you've learned from science and what you know from Wu. Yeah. So like, let's talk a little bit just about that crazy thing that happened to, to bring you into this world and me into yours. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I had been, I was about two years into downloading my brain into documents, thinking that somehow along the way it would become a book. And then I got to the point where I was like, well, I have a lot of pages, a lot of words, a lot of things. I don't 
know what I'm now supposed to do with this. Um, and I had just talked to Katie, my niece, she lives with us, um, about like, I don't know if there's such a thing as like a book coach or somebody that can help you take all this stuff and put it into something coherent. I need to, I'm, I'm going to look into that. And I think it was maybe one or two days later, some friends from um, Orange County came down to stay with us. And they, of course, said, oh, how's your book going? And I'm like, well, funny, you ask. It's, I, it's not really going because I don't really know what to do next. I'm hoping that there's someone out there or a field out there that can help. And literally, my friend goes, you know, my aunt just published a book. She just wrote and published a book. And I think she worked with a book coach. Do you want me to get her name? <laughs> um, yes, please. I mean, it was that quick. And within, I think I talked to Aunt Chris the next day, talked to her a little bit about what I have been doing. And then she said, well, let me text you and Amanda, this person I've been working with on my own book and see if you guys um, might want to work together. So I, I think two days later, I had a Zoom call with Amanda and um, you know, talked about what my book was about and what I was hoping to accomplish. And she said, I don't really work, like fiction isn't really my thing. Um, but let me take a look at what you've put together. And um, I can, you know, I can probably refer you to somebody that works a little bit more in the world of fiction. And I had that little heart drop, like, oh, oh no. Um, but at the same time thinking, okay, if that's how this needs to go, it, it's how it needs to go. Um, so then let's see, maybe like a month, Amanda, we, we kind of went back and forth. I sent her everything I had put together and it was a mess, a mass of mess. And we set up another follow-up call and Amanda tells me, you know, it's so interesting that this is happening right now because what your book, part of what your book is about is happening with somebody I know in my life. And I feel like maybe this is a little bit of an invitation to um, that we're supposed to work together. I'm supposed to be involved in this. So then next thing you know, we're like, oh, oh, okay, I guess, I guess we're gonna do this. And she said, I'm gonna send you a you know, contract and terms and whatnot. And, you know, I knew I was gonna do it. I mean, I just knew it. I felt like it was the right thing to do, but I methodically went through the contract and tried to be mindful of all of my own doubts and worries. And I don't know, should I do it? Um, so I pulled a card out of this Oracle deck I have. And I, you know, again, I don't know Amanda. And I'm thinking she's gonna think I'm the weirdest person ever. It's fun, I'm gonna wanna do this thing with me. So I, I pull a card. Actually, I take that back. I was shuffling. I was going to pull a card and one like flung out of the deck and landed on my lap face up just like this. And it was the rabbit card. And I remember thinking, well, that's interesting. because I've never, I don't remember ever pulling that one before. So I'm like, I think, eh, what is this one about? So I go to like my little trusty book and it's fear and the, the kind of medicine in the, in the rabbit uh, or the magic in the rabbit medicine is you know, you can paralyze yourself getting worried about all the things that could happen and may not happen. And what do I do and doubt? And the, if you've pulled this card, it's really an invitation to just let all that stuff go, move forward, make it happen. And I said, oh, well, that's quite fitting. So I send an email back to Amanda with my signed contract and I put the card, like I took a picture, put the card in there and I'm like, if you know about these things but this is what I pulled and I think it was really perfect and like four seconds later she replies saying so you can't make this up my maiden name in Portuguese means rabbit I was like you've got to be kidding me you really can't make this up so it was like then and there in that moment I'm like I mean I was already sure we were going to be working together but that like sealed it at that mm -hmm. moment so yeah that's yeah. confirmation. And I love it too, because, you know, so much of the creative process is like that, right? Like you just kind of have to follow what's coming at you. You can't really, I mean, I hear a lot of people say that they can like, you know, button the seat every day and you just push the project forward. And I just go, mm. 
there is something about like consistent action showing up, but like every day and when you don't have the muse and the magic showing up, it makes it challenging. It makes it, you know, and so it was really fun because I remember you telling me during our first session that you'd experience some of that in the first part of this process. And so I'd love for you to share a little bit because I felt like that experience with our getting connected was kind of like a, a reignition yeah. of that synchronicity for you. Yeah. So what was it like? What, tell us about what your project is about and, and uh, where it took you. Um, yeah, so the, a little bit of the backstory is I had just sold my business. This was, um, I'd sold my business in 2017, spent, you know, the kind of the majority of that year helping transition it to the new owner. So I was going to stay on as a consultant, but was really lost, like really just wasn't sure what I kind of was supposed to be doing next. And I'm driving to work super irritated because my commute went from like six minutes to like 46 minutes. I'm trying to figure out like, what am I going to do with this now? I'm like, oh, maybe I should listen to podcasts. Maybe look books on, yeah, I don't know. I was just kind of swimming. And literally it was like something dropped into my head. This idea of you should write a book, but it was so clear and so um, like strong and not even like it didn't even feel like an idea. It felt like a, you, this is what you should be doing. So I get to work and I'm like, well, oh my gosh, what would I, like, what, what would I write about? And then I had this like instant, I know what I'm going to write about. I'm going to write about what I know and what I love. Mm. So I'm going to write a story. It's going to be fiction. It's not going to be a resource book. It's not going to be a how-to book, fiction book about a a family's journey or, or, you know, a person's journey um, through the idea of having symptoms, so to speak, that get couched in mental illness language um, and start the process of, you know, isolation and fear and lack, lack of hope, loss of hope. And what if they don't look at it as mental illness. What if this family looks at it as something else, a gift, a spiritual experience, whatever. So it, like, just real quick, I had this little idea form of like, well, I'm gonna, apparently I'm gonna write a book and I kind of already know what it's gonna be about. And I go to work and I tell my friend, uh, Melissa, who I still work with, I just had this idea and I, I wanted the accountability. Like I wanted to put it out there so I would not somehow talk myself out of doing this. And so I tell her and she just sits there and looks at me and goes, of course you are. Like it was like somehow everybody knew this but me <laughs> before I did. Because um, I had said, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not done. I'm done with this role that I've been in for a long time, but I'm not done. And she's like, nope, you're not done. Of course you are. And it, like that was that. It was so confirming and validating that, um, you know, like I, it's hard to describe that feeling, right? Where you just, it's like you just know something is true. And there just was not really any room around it to, to doubt or to mm, uh, like worry if this is the right thing. It just felt so solid. So it was really within a few weeks, I started just putting my ideas to paper and, um, you know, it, it changed shapes so many times over the process, but the, the, the majority of the original idea really just stayed true to what ended up being in the book. Yeah. Yeah. What is it like to just, I mean, to have that idea, because I haven't written fiction myself and the fiction that's on my plate, uh, my, my future plate is, is um, closely reality-based, right? It's fictionalized life stuff um, intentionally, which is cool. But what is it like to just have a story drop in? Like, did you have a character that you initially saw or... Did you see a setting? Like, what was that? What was that experience like? Mm -hmm. I I did have a character. I like what came into my mind is a 
um, young man, maybe around 13, 14 years old, that, which is sometimes the age that, um, like if there's a psychosis or schizophrenia in the mix, it may start showing up around that time. So that was my thought. Okay, there's going to be this person who hits that that age where something starts happening and it typically it opens up the, um, now we're going to go see a doctor and then we're going to go see a psychiatrist and we're going to get a diagnosis and get Medicaid, right? It, there's this kind of path. And that is, even though I'm in the field of psychology and mental health treatment, that's, that's not the, that's not the path I, I like. So the idea was the path is going to really almost force this person and the family to go this way, but he's convinced that what he's experiencing is something else. And so the, um, the struggle to be open to the idea that this will, okay, may, maybe it is schizophrenia, maybe it is psychosis, maybe there is something going on, but what if there's more to the story? What if there's a different way of looking at this that doesn't, um, cast this person in this like mentally ill identity and almost like sets up their identity and their life for them. Um, so I, I really instantly have that idea and the um, part of the setting or not setting, part of the story um, relates to a, a country, a town in Belgium that has been practicing for 700 plus years. This, this, um, perspective and view and treatment of people that like Western, we diagnose as mentally ill. Mm. And um, I've always loved the story of that town. I've known about it for a very long time. I love the inspiration behind it. So that was, that was really it. It's, so this is happening here. This person thinks it might be something else and somehow gets connected to this country that really can end up ultimately confirming, no, it's something else. Yeah. Yeah. Can you share a little bit about that, the, the treatment of care? Because I know this is like this perspective that you have around treatment. It's what really made me want to work with you. Like, mm -hmm. because it was, you know, it's that thread of even when Aaron was little, you know, I, when I was learning, I was on the path of becoming a teacher and so much of what I was learning through my education classes, through working with my dad, through the little bit of um, quantum physics that I was starting to, you know, dabble in was like how you look at a thing or a person yes. changes the thing or the person. Yes. And so this idea of like, you know, in my case, looking at this young child and having this image of him that was more like, I'm going to focus most of my energy on the divinity in you and call all of that forth. And then when I see all of these little things happen that are outside of it, I'm going to figure out a different way of addressing that than how it was addressed with me. Like, it's not because you're a sinner. It's because you made a bad choice. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and so, so for me to see that perspective kind of pulled and extrapolated into a whole field of care mm -hmm. in psychology was just wildly exciting. Yeah. So I, I, and when you told me this story, I was just like, oh my God, that's a thing. Like, it, it's, it's amazing. Thing. It's a yeah. thing. <laughs> it's a real thing, which is, and it's amazing how few people really know about this and have even heard the story or anything about it. Right. Um, Cause for me, I'm like, this is it. This is the thing. This is what I believe this is what we, you know, should be doing. Um, so do so you want me to tell the story? The Saint Dimitri? Please, okay. please. Okay. So let's see. So the story goes in the seventh century, there was a young princess. Um, her husband was, or her, her dad was um, kind of like the king of this little town in Ireland and um, his married to a woman who was kind of considered the most beautiful in the land and very devout, very spiritual. Well, she suddenly dies. 
And the daughter at this time is maybe about 12 or 13. And the, so she's bereft. The dad just in his grief just descends into madness, like grief stricken madness. And is you know experiencing all this pressure in their village, like you, you need to get remarried, like you, you you need to have a wife. This is just part of the deal. Well, he sent his people out into the land, and like no wife, no woman would um, kind of meet up to his standards. And he, meanwhile, he continues to get more and more um, like loses touch with reality, really really sick. So he ends up having this idea: my daughter is the only one that is as beautiful as my wife, so I should marry her. And of course the daughter is like, mm, no, 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 thank you. Um, not, not, a, not interested, but he, he was unrelenting. And he, again, in the stories of the legend, he's very ill, he's very ill. So um, she just keeps resisting, re resisting. And because he won't stop, she kind of plots an escape. And so she's able, she escapes this little town in Ireland with um, like one of, the, one of the people from the church and a, kind of an assistant, dresses up like a boy so not to be recognized, gets to the coast, gets in a boat and just sets sail. So you fast forward a little bit, she lands in what we, is Antwerp, what we now know as Belgium. Um, and again, this is like seventh century stuff. So she gets there and start, they start walking inland, trying to figure out like what they're gonna do and they're in hiding. And along the way, she meets with people and they're just very drawn to her. And she decides, again, she's like 12 or 13. She wants to be helpful. She wants to help people. So she gets um, you know, a, a bit inland into this little farming town and sets up almost like a little, um, little shack, like a little treat, treatment to help people through her religion and through just her presence. Well, meanwhile, dad has scouts everywhere and they track her down because she's using money that um, connects her. They end up tracking her down. And so dad confronts her once again, you need to come back, you need to be my wife, I'm not gonna do it. So um, he orders one of his like colleagues, his people to convince her it wouldn't work, so he, he killed him. And then he's like, this is your last chance. Come back now or else. And she's like, okay, I'll take or else. And he kills her mm. um, and leaves. So she and the, the, the one assistant um, are kind of taken in and buried in this little town, right? Out, it's right outside Giel, Belgium. And all these miraculous things start happening. So people start coming to the area and feeling better and um, experiencing relief and um, he, being healed and cured. So this, the word gets out that there's something in this area that is making people better. So starting way back when people started pilgrimaging to the town um, almost to like pray at her bones. Mm for cure and relief. And as the word got out, more and more people came. And so what happened is there was a point in time so that the, the nuns who managed the church, you know, there's like a sick house in the church. So they're trying to take these people in. And most of the time they're getting, these are folks that are getting kind of dropped off and abandoned by family members. Cause like, I don't know, I don't know what to do with this guy or this woman. So all these kind of abandoned people. And the nuns are doing their best to like bring him in and treat them nicely. Um, and it gets so full, they, they're not gonna turn people away. So they go out into the community, this little farming community and said, okay, families, we need you to take one and you to take one and you to take one. Like didn't give them any information, just like we, you, we need help. And what they started finding is, um, the, the kids or the people who got placed in a home in the community versus the ones that stayed in the sick house started getting better and getting better really, really quickly. So it started this idea. So now at this point, I mean, we're, you know, hundreds of years later, 
um, started this idea like, huh, well, there's something about just living, living at home with a family that seems to be better for people than being in a, in a hospital or a sick house. So then this movement started to not have people be in a sick house unless they were really, really ill, but to just be placed almost like an adult foster care. And what ended up developing through this is this strategy or this approach where somebody would find their way to this little town in Belgium or be dropped off by family members and they would be placed in a house in the, in the farmland and were not told, like the families were not told anything, right? Like, oh, he has these, like they didn't even call it symptoms, they called it nothing. The only directive was treat this person exactly the same way that you treat everybody else in your family. This is a family member, it's a sibling, it's a son, it's a daughter, whatever, no special treatment, same as everybody else. And then people got even better. So this system of care, which now has been in place in that town for 700 years, still happening, is that people come and are essentially adopted. Nobody is considered ill. Nobody is considered symptomatic. Uh, people are considered gifted. They just have gifts that haven't been maybe uh, identified or utilized. And they have to do the same as everybody else. So no special treatment, you contribute, you help with the dishes, you help with the farm. So there's nothing in the interaction where the person is kind of seen as ill. They're not called patients, they're not called clients, they're called um, guests or boarders because most of the time they stay, they'll stay for their whole lives. And they, they still have a, a little hospital in town just in case somebody really needs a little bit extra help. But otherwise, this is the town. They, you know, work and contribute and are part of the community and in no way are identified as separate, identified as different or treated any differently. So the, the system of care, and there's been books, I mean, not many, but there's been a few books on it from people who've gone over and stayed in the town to just see, and they're like, it's really like this is. And so one example is you could walk through the grocery store and you might have somebody in there who is talking to themselves or behaving in some kind of idiosyncratic way that we in kind of our culture would, oh my gosh, he's talking to himself, he's hearing voices. It's like not even um, like looked at. It's just consider that's okay. Well, that's what that person's doing. So the, the, the care model that came out of this really supports the um, destigmatization mm -hmm. and um, like di diagnosis and kind of a, a segregating of people, but more of an acceptance and a belonging into a community where you're wanted versus. Um, you know, like, uh, like you kind of have to be there. Mm. So the, that's kind of the, the long story and the tenets of this, this model that I've always um, loved. And in the therapeutic community that I've been a part of for a really long time, worked really, really hard to make that the, the philosophy that every single staff person that worked for me, that worked um, in our organization was, all the expectations are the same, no special treatment. I guess I get this person carries a diagnosis on paper, maybe even is taking medication, that's totally fine. But in terms of expectation and treatment, just like everybody else, and people get better. They rise incredible. to the occasion, so. That's incredible. I, I just, I love that. What Did you learn about that when you were in school? Was that part of the? I learned about it working at the therapeutic community early, early on. Um, because even when I started working there, I, I started working there as an intern. I bought it several years later, but I was like very new, very um, inexperienced, had just gotten a master's degree, uh, didn't have a lot of practical experience. I started working there, I got hired as an intern. And kind of, um, it was my first exposure to the idea of like not treating patients like patients. You know, everything I learned in school was very much like the patient, the doctor, the treatment you give, 
the treat, you know, like the, the treatment you do. And I, so getting exposed to this idea of like, well, I'm, I'm not the like magic person here. This is their life. <laughs> Pressure's off. Um, I'm here to support and treat, treat all the people who are enrolled in this program as human beings. And, you know, I mean, to the population has become so accustomed to being treated as a patient and, and puts the onus and responsibility of their health and wellness in the hands of doctors, clinicians, therapists. So there's a very disempowering, low uh, personal agency kind of identity that goes often with a population that is considered um, like chronic or seriously mentally ill. So the idea of sitting down with somebody and saying like, well, what do you want to do in your life? Like what interests you? How often I would be met with just a blank, blank stare. Like, I don't know, because there's not been a lot of support and encouragement for people to be anything outside of their, their label. So, um, you know, getting started at this program and like people have to do chore. Nobody is going to come in and make your bed for you. If you're hungry, go make yourself a sandwich. There's like very little like caretaking. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of empowerment. And I mean, you know, the clients will come in with, I mean, an identity of I'm like mentally ill. I can't, I can't cook for myself. Yes, you can. Like, oh, I need a ride to the store. No, you don't. Like, but this, they believe it too. The clients For that sure. I started seeing, so it, that in being exposed to this like different way, um, I, I learned like pretty early on about this town, like this town in Belgium that's almost considered like the original therapeutic community. And so when I went and read about it, and then read about the, um, I mean the the girl who was murdered by her dad, like martyred, you know, six or seven hundred years later um, was saint sainted. So she's the patron saint, so Saint Dymphna, and she's the patron saint of mental illness and uh, also patron saint for psychologists. And a lot of it comes from, you know, she was trying to help almost like people like her father. Mm, sure. Um, wouldn't that be a shocker? Wouldn't that be a shocker? <laughs> like, what, what, I, I don't know what you're talking about. All of us people trying to help other people. Yeah, I mean, exactly. You probably didn't start anywhere like that, right? Yeah. I'm interested to hear what's coming up for everyone here because I've heard these stories, but you've all known Carlin in one way, shape, or form, um, but you haven't heard like this stuff. So what what's it bringing up for you with regard to like, we all have people in our lives that have been labeled or maybe we've had those labels or like what is that bringing up for you in your own experience anyone as soon as she's it was brought up that that um how you might have to say it better because it's not something I talk about so I don't have the words but how you see somebody or what you see affects what were the words just give it to me how you quick. how you look at a person changes the person Ch uh, how you look at a person changes the person I don't know if anybody saw me but I mean I got um it makes me want to cry I got goosebumps all over because you know coming from a biblical standpoint it said you shall be witnesses of me and I really believe that that means that we would witness him in others mm. to observe him in others, to bring that, to bring that out of them versus trying to tell them you need to, you should, or, you know, and so uh, I don't know that just confirmed, like there's so much power in witnessing the divine you talked about seeing the divine in your you know being a witness of the divine that that is our job is to see that in others and the miracles that can happen when we do i mean i'm i'm sitting here blown away just just in relationship like those yes. people in that town had no directive to be healers or helpers or caretakers it was just be in relationship with them. I mean, what if it's just that simple? 
well, I think I think that that's a great comment. What if it's just that simple? And I guess it was confirmation for me that the things I'm doing with my grandchildren and the way I'm treating them and that when they're with me, there's that higher expectation. You know, I still expect you to participate. I still expect you to um, make your bed before you come to breakfast. <laughs> you get breakfast at Ema's house when your bed is made. You don't get it before then, you know? I, it's just the way it is. And I think it's even just those, those little things, those little tasks that actually empower them and give them that knowledge, that ability to say, oh, I can do this. And if I can do this, then what else can I do? You know, um, and I have to tell you, when you said that that idea dropped into your head, um, that was that was like um, I had I had made the comment when Amanda and I were talking that I I my fingers just typed it out on the keyboard for one of my goals for the year for this this course. What not not a course here, but a course I was taking <laughs> that I was going to write a book, and I remember Amanda saying, "Your fingers typed that." <laughs> so it's kind of that same thought process. It was, yeah, it just the idea dropped into your head. Mine was my fingers typed it out, you know. So, but I, I totally agree with you that if we if we will see people, here's the way I look at it. If we will see people as Christ sees us, um, in all of our glory, in all of our abilities, and all of our potential, then we can accomplish so much more. So that was yeah. my answer. This was um, actually, as you were talking, it was reminding me a lot of uh, my studies at the university because we were my my I was doing my degree work for cultural anthropology, but I took a medical anthropology class that um, dove a lot into the perspectives that developed around mental illness across different cultures, and so it's so beautiful to see all of the diversity in the ways that people perceive mental illness in different, you know, parts of the world, because we've been so groomed to see it in one particular way here in the U S but also I thought as you were, as you were talking about um, kind of, you know, people seeing them and the differences and how, you know, they were treated like they were human. Uh, it was bringing up all of the conversation around meaning and purpose that we need to thrive. Like we need to know that we are meaningful to people around us. We need to know that we have a purpose here to actually see of any sort of potential future for ourselves. You know, that was kind of what it brought up for me. I think it, in that same vein, the idea of being seen, right? Just being seen and asked and interested in, and what do you want to do? What are you all about? I mean, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking when I think about so many conversations I've had with people over the years where just that simple question like, oh, well, what, what do you like? What are you all about? Tell me something. And just the blank, like, I don't, I don't know. Because the idea of meaning and purpose and being able to do something other than be an ill person is like not even been in their mind. So that I think that is the belonging and being seen and asked and encouraged is definitely the, the fact that after you ask that you're listening yeah. you know like yes. you're, you're not just you know moving on to the next thing when they don't say okay. oh i think it's this yeah. they give you that blank stare and, and you know you wait yeah. and you encourage and you nudge yeah. and you know and even talk about know. what is it like you seem to be having a reaction to my question. What is this like being asked what you want to do in life? You know, sometimes that brings up a whole bunch of stuff. So yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. It's that conversation that gets me so excited to read your book mm -hmm. because your main character is just on the cusp of diagnosis at a young age and I'm excited to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> He's so cool. <laughs> I love Finn. So, okay. So you have this amazing background of understanding. And this is like, we've talked about this for you. Like, this is a whole other, like new season, right? You're still 
you're still working with people, still helping them to sort themselves out and heal. You're still, I know you're working on a new project now to have another facility or not facility, but a, a, a care space where they'll have that experience of community and belonging. <laughs> and this is like a whole new, I don't know, limb for you kind of, but it, it feels like a really familiar one. Like I read your writing. I'm just like, wow, this is someone who is naturally a gifted writer and also is obviously well-read. So when you thought about the book and you thought about the process of writing it, did you have ideas of like, I want it to be like this type of book, or was there, was there a book that you love that you were like, if I could get it to to read like this or feel like this. Yeah. It- yeah. A lot of, of, yeah, a lot of books I've had that experience with, um, you know, when, when I first started writing it, it, I wanted it to be a book that would instill hope, you know, for anybody, either an individual, a parent, a sister, a spouse, whatever, who might be, um, experiencing mental illness in their life or the idea of mental illness or a diagnosis or whatever. The idea that, um, okay, yeah, on paper, it may, yes, all those boxes might've been checked that say you have major depressive disorder. Okay. And what else is there in here? What else might this be? Um, So I wanted it to have this kind of magical, aha type experience for people. Because again, I think about my experience working with a lot of families and individuals over the year, the hopelessness and the, um, the narrowness and the idea that it can, well, the doctor says he has paranoid schizophrenia, like that now we're looking at a life of antipsychotics and group homes. I'm like, whoa, whoa, what, what do you mean? You know, the, this idea, but that's very, very common. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I incorporate into the book, also very much my experience in the therapeutic community over the last 25 years is um, a lot of cul- culture and belief through the Lakota Sioux Nation. Mm-hmm. Um, from the, the perspective of, of that um, nation it's very much spiritual so like you were saying Alyssa about like different cultures and how they see mental illness in that culture if somebody is experiencing visions or hearing hearing things you know things that we call auditory vision uh, hallucinations you know visual hallucinations they're considered gifted they're actually considered having been kind of like selected by the ancestors and they're being given messages with with like a kind of a purpose and an obligation to go out and do that to help other people. So they're revered. This is like the medicine men are people who hear voices, um, who, who have visions and who, who experience those um, sensations as, okay, there's something in here that I'm supposed to be um, listening to and and thinking about and doing, um, so it's not there's not like a stigma or any you know really. So going back to your your question, Amanda, like one book that I've I've read several times. It's like one of my favorite books. It's called Black Elk Speaks, and it he was a medicine man, warrior, chief um, Nicholas Black Elk in the Lakota Sioux tribe. And um, he talks about his, his life of having visions when he was really young and being like afraid to tell anybody because what are people going to think? And then finally, when he told somebody, they're like, this is amazing. And so he, it, it, going back to how people are seeing changes, right? He went from, I need to hide, I need to keep secret, I need to not tell anybody about this because they're all going to think I'm really weird. Um, to, to, he was like, he was turned and became this like, amazing healer because he embraced you know the this uh, how the other people were experiencing him and he was still young enough to be able to to do that um so his his account of his life and all the different things that he went through i love that book and to me it's 
the synchronicity in his life is amazing. Um, so I, I, to me, it's this idea of discovery and not ruling things out and it also not being like either or. Like in mm -hmm. our present day culture, if he presented with some of the things that he presented with when he was four, nine, 17, we'd be looking at the, the diagnosis book for sure. But can it, can it be that and this? Mm -hmm. And if we are, you know, can we consider, if we consider this a little bit more than just be set over here, what are the possibilities available? What are the hidden purposes, hidden meetings? So being able to discover that um, is what I think is the beauty of it, but it's really hard, especially in our, our current day with, um, I mean, there's still a lot of stigma around mental illness and fear and misunderstanding. So it's hard for people. I think it's hard for people to um, not like to tell what they're experiencing, to share what they're experiencing, fear of being judged or diagnosed or sent away or whatever. Yeah. It's easier to keep it secret. And even as it gets more open, right? Even as we have the conversations about equity and, and really embracing everybody with all of their um, unique characteristics, mm -hmm. there's still all of that genetic material, right? Like that are, I mean, just two generations back in our family, there was a child who was very, very different. My guess would be autistic because I did meet this person a few times, but this person was hidden from the world, yeah. kept at home for decades. Mm -hmm. And it was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Right. And so just to think about that, that that is, you know, running through my veins. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's part of, it's part of the way that I was raised in this culture of like, well, some of these things we just don't talk about because mm -hmm. we don't know what to say about them. <laughs> we yeah. don't know. Right. Yeah. Um, and that, and how sad it is that these people who, I mean, I used to see this person's art, like extremely gifted mm -hmm. individuals hidden. Hidden. Yeah. Yeah. And then, like you said, like generations, you know, we kind of inherit uh, you know, what was told to us, what was told to them. So there's the sense of not, maybe not even knowing any better. Right. Um, and I mean, again, working with so many families over the years where, you know, you're hearing parents, they're like in a total grief process because here's this child that they had all these dreams and aspirations for. And now they're really sick and having parents say like, well, you know, he'll never get married. I'm like, well, okay, hang on. Or, um, it's so hard to go to spe to like weddings mm. or big public gatherings because you know people are like when they ask I don't know what to say. So I've had families saying I, I don't even go because I don't like to be in that situation. Or families talk about how like so they say they also have another child who's not ill. Well, they'll say well you know everyone will ask me about Susie but nobody ever asks me about mm. Bobby. Because again, then those people don't want to ask and bring it. So there's all this kind of shame and stigma and hiding and fear and how much people kind of lock into that. Parents who are like, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know if he'll ever get married or she'll ever get married or have baby. I we don't know yet. But the fact, but the fact that that's already like off the table as a possibility for this person, maybe we should look at that a little bit. Again, I, it doesn't mean he's going to get married. I don't. Right. But as long as so like why, I said, why create that person's future yeah. reality for yeah. them? Yeah. Instead of being curious about mm -hmm. how far they could go, how yeah. much and what they do they want experience. to do? Um, so there's a lot there about kind of the learned helplessness and the the narrowness that comes in the in the realm of mental illness versus, you know, being able to see people differently. And that's really hard. I mean, I do this a lot in my work with 
um, people is uh, the people I work with who have children, and these are adult adult children with mental illness, um, saying like one of the first things we need to work on is how you view your child and how we're going to change that view of your child. Because as long as you think of him as incapable, needing your help, not able to do things on his own, can't make friends, et cetera, he, that is the identity he's going to live in. But if we can help you see your child is absolutely capable. Yep. Does he have schizophrenia? Yep. Also capable. And that's really hard for people to do because that mom or dad and their mom or dad have all, you know, have been kind of shaped in that yeah. um, paradigm too. So yeah. it's, it's a big, it's a big effort. It's a big task. So working. this is the big task that you took on with this project. And, yeah. and when we sat down to talk about it, like I loved the story of Finn, you know, this, this young man who's having uh, episodes of some sort, right? Like, are they, are they hallucinations? Mm -hmm. Are they invitations to a transcendent experience? Is he supposed to be, you know, getting messages or, you know, he, all of these possibilities. Mm -hmm. And so I love that story. And also when we first started talking about this, it was like, who's, is, is that the reader that we want? Right? Like, well, yeah. And I mean, everything that we've been talking about here, it's really the people around the yeah. person who need the therapy, right? Like <laughs> they're the ones who need to be sorted out and, oh. and talk to about how their perspectives might not be accurate. Like yes. what else is possible here? So will you share a little bit about that process? Cause <laughs> no, it wasn't easy for you. You're like no, so attached not. to Finn. And, and so as we talked about it, like the main character changed. And so I'd love for you to share, you know, as much of that as you're wanting to. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was rough in the beginning. Cause you know, Finn had been the guy for two years. I've been writing about and thinking about. And um, so when you and I started working together and we were kind of at the very beginning, right? I had a whole bunch of content, but we didn't have any structure. We didn't have art, these kind of things. You kept saying, I, I don't know if he's the one, like, I don't know if he's the main character. I'm like, yes, he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think it might be the mom. No, no, she's not even a big character. Like, I mean, I just was so attached. Um, but, you know, as you invited me to look at like, well, why don't you, what if you wrote out the kind of the arc of the story from Finn's perspective, from her perspective, dad's, you know, all these other people's perspective, it became very clear that um, I think what you said was so helpful was who's going to experience the most change in this story. And it actually was not Finn. Mm -hmm. He has some change in there, but um, she's the one that really has the biggest arc of change in the, in the story. So then, then going back and like rethinking all of this content and plot from her perspective versus his, I mean, that was a challenge. Um, and then of course, what ended up happening is plotting it out from her perspective, his perspective, and then the dad's perspective, the, the book became a three perspective book instead of just one. And, and I think that that really changed the whole style of the story because now you're, there's one experience, there's like an experience that's happening, but we're getting it from three different people's perspective, which is totally influenced by their past. So that um, that kind of generational transmission of beliefs and ideas and thoughts shows up really loudly. Yeah, it shows up really loudly. And I remember too, because you know, so much of, of what we do here is witness some sort of healing take place for the people who are writing. And, um, and so, you know, from my perspective, I meet this amazing accomplished psychologist with these, you know, two and a half decades of community care. And, and I'm like, 
Well, I, you know, I mean, I'm, I, my job is to challenge you, right? Like my job is to say, uh, what about this? And what about that? But the thing that was the hardest was, um, dear therapist, is there something here for you too? <laughs> no, no. It's just a fictional story. That's not, that's not about me. No. Oh my Lord. Yeah, that was, that was the biggest and, and where it got the most messy and definitely where I ran into obstacles along the way, because I was, no, I mean, you know, yeah, sure. Are these characters, these different characters, like little bits and parts of me? Sure. Of course. They're like low parts that I, you know, the, the mom has some experiences that I can totally relate to. And certainly the kid and the dad over here and this guy over here and the therapist of it. Sure. They're all like little bits of me, but no, this isn't about me. It's just how it informed. Oh my gosh. Argue, argue, argue. Of course, I, I'm a nice arguer, but, but you didn't really like, I, I mean, you just kept showing up and doing like you showed up to the story healing retreats and you were like deep in it I mean, and we'll just go through it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you got a you you showed up to a retreat right and that's where you kind of slammed into whatever yeah. that was that we couldn't figure out what was what was it yeah Let's talk about that because that was so I mean when we're talking about the healing that's possible through writing and mm -hmm. through even fiction mm -hmm. and then looking at the implications I just please tell the story I love it so much it, I mean, that was probably the biggest turning point. I had another big one towards the end of the story, but this one was the one that, I mean, I, like I'm game, you know, I'm a therapist, I, I get it. I get the idea that I might be, I'm missing something, I'm in a blind spot. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll think about it. But there was this kind of slow, like little slow erosion of this fantasy I had that this really was just a fictional story as more and more things became clear, like, oh, I'm kind of writing about myself right now. Um, but we're at this retreat. And this was May, I think, Amanda. So I really yeah. wasn't like super far into the writing. I mean, I think I was maybe not even halfway. I don't even think I was halfway. No. So I'm, I'm at the retreat and I'm going to be working on this one chapter that in my mind was going to probably be like the most fun chapter to write of the book it was all the stuff about the Lakota Sioux ceremonies and rituals and traditions and and the storytelling I was like so excited and somehow I just couldn't it like was not happening I'm sitting there on my computer I'm like I, I, the words are not coming like Lori like nothing was happening in my fingertips and I thought it was strange because I was really actually looking forward to this part. And so finally, um, after a little bit of grappling with this, and I just, well, why don't you just take a break, put that aside. There's no, no rule says you have to like go in order of writing all these chapters, just pick another chapter and work on something else. And you know, when the, when the energy's back, you'll, you'll go back to it. Now, hold on. I have to interrupt this because yes. from my perspective, I'm watching you like have, I mean, you already have trouble sleeping, right? But like now you're having nightmares. Yeah. And in the morning, you know, we're debriefing and you're like not feeling well. Yeah. And I'm like, there is some sort of connection that we have to figure out here. But it was like, every time I asked, nope, I don't think it's connected, right? So, so me asking you to go to another chapter, I thought that you were gonna like, my my thinking was, let's go to chapter that's easy, right? Like quick, something that's magical, something you know, like cap capture you, hit all those dopamine buttons and just make you feel like so excited about continuing, right? That's, that's what I'm thinking. And then like hours later, I see you on the couch <laughs> and you're like sweating. <laughs> I have a headache, my stomach hurt, my feet hurt, my back hurt. Like I just was, I was nauseous. I mean, it was so, of course, instead of just picking a random chapter that might be like kind of fun and light to write, I, again, not even knowing what I was doing, I pick and punch out in like pretty much one day what might be the most like emotionally upsetting chapter of the entire book. So I'm like, I did not pick the, I did not go the easy route. I think it picked me to write that. So it's a, you know, the, the, it's a chapter where the, the mom is seeing this therapist um, 
maybe for like the, fir oh, the first time individually. And even in this short, in this kind of one session, what starts emerging is that she has a lot of repressed um, like tra trauma that she wasn't even really aware was in there. So some of it starts showing up in this chapter and I'm writing it and I'm feeling it, but in my, in my mind, I'm like, well, you know, this happens. Like you get really deep into a story or an idea. You'll feel some of those feelings. It's like I was feeling her feelings. And I, that's literally how I was thinking about it. Um, and it was rough, but like, okay, I got through it. Good chapter. So then I don't know. It was, it was really, it, I don't think it could have been more than a couple of days. I don't know when I came home, Amanda, but it was like the next day or the day after that from the retreat, this giant family secret is like revealed in my family. And it was like, it had been kept secret in some ways repressed by people, hidden all this shame all this stuff around like family messaging. And I was like, I mean, and I almost could not believe it. I'm like, no, this, there's no way this is true. And it was true. So talking to all of these people um, and it wasn't my secret. It wasn't anything that was directly connected to me but it was in, my, in the family. And as we start, I start kind of digging in a little bit and I'm talking to my sister and a couple of different people. So many things started making sense in my own family I'm like oh all these years when we didn't know why that happened now we know why it happened or why this person did this and that person didn't do that like so many things it was so amazing and when I called a man I'm like you're not gonna believe what just happened so what we kind of realized what was, didn't know what was happening, but what we realized in hindsight is at the retreat, I was really like channeling this thing that was happening in this, in my system, even though I didn't know, I didn't know it yet. Um, and it was showing up in this chapter because it was so similar. I mean, I wrote the chapter before I knew the thing and I go home and being able to talk about this with a couple of family members and what that was like and what it meant and how so many things made make sense now. There was a, um, like, I didn't understand or didn't even real, I didn't know how much that was holding me inside. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't even know it existed. But once this came out and we started talking about it, there was this like lifting and um, almost like a clearing and at that point forward, like the next several chapters, I just like, they were, they were out in no time. I, I felt like something opened mm -hmm. and then I could like get in the zone. This thing that I had been blocking me that I didn't even know was in there, which was so weird because that's the chapter I wrote. Right. With, so we're like, no, it's, oh, yes, it's just fiction. There's nothing about this. But anything to do with me well and I I think that's so important I mean we have you know who's listening to these podcasts like other creatives people are trying to work on these projects and you know we have all these reasons why we get stuck right like oh I'm just um you know I'm too busy I have this other thing going I um oh I have a stomach thing that happens every time I sit down to write oh right and all these different things and you know maybe it's fear maybe it's um, exposure. Maybe it's, you know, it's different for everyone. And this experience with you was like, holy crap, it could be generational trauma keeping yeah. someone from writing it. Like maybe yeah. that's what, I mean, it, clearly your, your nurture as a child inspired at least some of your direction in life, right? Like you can buy all of that, honestly, as I've heard, yes. right? <laughs> the desire to help other people. Yeah. And so, you know, I think that it's just, it just like cracked open this other thing of like, why do we write these stories? Well, sometimes we need to process our own stuff. And sometimes we're processing generational stuff. Yeah. Like that is, that was just like a whole other level for me yeah. of totally. how to see how that stuff can keep us from doing the things that we mm -hmm. feel inspired to do that will change the world. Just mm -hmm. incredible. If you think about that, 
if it's stuff we don't know about consciously or any, the only way, whew, the only way that's going to come out is through fiction. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, Teddy, maybe, I mean, that's when I started telling people that I was going to write a book, everyone, like a lot of people assumed it was going to be about like the work about therapeutic communities or about psychology or about like that it was going to be nonfiction. I'm like, oh no, this is going to be fair. Like it was very, very clear to me when I, that I would be writing fiction. So I think you're right. It's like, it was something, you know, calling or pulling on me that I didn't even know about, but that's exactly what happened. And again, what I think is so, you know, mind blowing is the character in my book, the mom in the book, this is what happened. Like the stuff that was um, interfering with her and really affecting her, she didn't even know. And you'd so written it, a whole bunch of that before you ever got to me and made so her much. the primary character. Like you had all of this stuff. And it's just, I mean, what is that? You're just, your DNA talking to you, you know, like waking you up in the middle of the night and being like, here's this idea that I'm going to make you think just came from this muse, but actually it's from, uh, you know, two generations back on the, yeah. this side, you know? Yeah. <laughs> That, I mean, that's pretty much what it was. So, so going through that process and, and having that experience that there's something in there, to, I mean, it's amazing and interesting, but there, I, there's something in it that I find um, reassuring, right? This idea of like, okay, you know what? I, apparently there's all kinds of things that I, my body knows that I don't know. And okay, like when it's ready to come out, if it's important that it comes out, if it has some kind of meaning or it, it will like it will like you know almost like I, you don't have to worry about it like you don't have to go in there and start searching and thinking and finding right. it'll show up don't worry about it that's like the way it left me because I was stunned still still kind of stunned um but it did leave me with that sense of huh okay well apparently that's when it needed to show up Maybe I would have gone my whole life not knowing that if I hadn't decided to write this book. Right. Yeah. I just, I mean, and since then, the amount of, um, you know, even when I think about, you know, uh, clients coming into my world at the time that they do, you know, like you all come in at this perfect time. And then there's like, this thing that has happened since this this experience with you last year that I'm thinking like wow the generational work that can get done so meanwhile Aaron and I are working on a religion of story right which is basically like unwinding all of the let's see all of the disempowering beliefs and trauma around uh religion for me um, and being able to rewrite all of that while hanging out with my son, eating popcorn and dark chocolate, like it's awesome. Right. But so that's happening in the background, but then we have, um, all of these other things that start to happen in this community as a result, like people bringing family members to quests and these other things that we're doing. And so, and then, you know, I said that ridiculous thing about maybe the three sisters should write their their fiction at the same time, you know, like it's just, it's so much bigger than what we even thought about. Like the, the little rabbit card was, was uh, popping up just for, just as much for me as for you and the other people in this community, because I mean, Teddy, you have been around this community for mm, 10 years, 12 years almost. And, you know, You've been married the whole time and never once has your husband wanted to participate or at least said that out loud. Right. And then all of a sudden this stuff happens around generational stuff in the business. And now your husband pops in and her sister pops in and someone else brings it. I'm just like, what is happening here? It's, <laughs> it's wild, right? Yes, there is something generational going on because I was 
just in California um, caring for my mom as she uh, passed. And in that process of going through her things and I discovered things that, oh, generational, that I have been healing generational stuff is not just me, you know, like things that, anyway, it, I think generational stuff is more, uh, I, if I hadn't, if my mom hadn't kept old letters, if she, I would have never known this stuff, you know? Hidden in the family. uh, It's in the family. It's in the DNA. And I've struggled with it and I've been healing it, it, you know, and it wasn't just me. I was healing. I was healing my mom. I was healing ants. I was, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's so amazing. Oh my goodness. So of all of the, of all the experiences, that was, that was quite amazing. Are there any others that you'd like to share about the, you know, the stories behind the stories and what has happened through the, the creative process for you? I know you've had a lot of things going on in the background, like Mm -hmm. these chapters closing as you're getting ready to open Mm -hmm. the new one of, of being an author and probably not of just the one book, right? Like this, maybe this is a series, maybe it's a whole world building project. So what's that been like for you? Um, Well, I think the, the other one that stands out to me was um, as I was getting towards the final few chapters, I, again, I like hit a wall. I'm like, oh my God, I'm almost done. And I just could could get there, even though I knew exactly how I wanted them to go. And you had suggested like, oh, like maybe you're having feelings about this process coming to a close. But now I've been waiting, the, come on, this is the goal, right? Goal is to finish this book. Um, but I'm like, okay, but at this point, like I'm sold. Obviously there's lots of stuff that is in this fic- fictional story that is so my stuff. So I'm like, okay, that's it. I'm, just, that's, I'm gonna just assume that that's true and just keep going. And I was at my office um, and I had, I had kind of outlined the final chapter, I was kind of getting there. And I, I, I can't even remember, I never stayed that late there. Like usually when I'm done with clients, I come home, but I stayed and I just started like writing my ideas and oh, like I'm crying, I'm like sobby crying. And the last, like literally the last, like kind of scene in the last chapter came, like came, fly- it came flying out of my fingers. And it was so obvious that what was happening literally in the chapter, which was what was happening for me in that very moment. Hmm. And it was like, you, you, I, I didn't even doubt it. It was so parallel. Um, and if, you know, thinking about the spinal scene in the book was, you know, was kind of the culmination of this entire story. And I was like, well, there it is. Oh my God. Like it was a completion for me as well. And it just, it took me to like that, it took me till that moment to really see it that clearly versus like, oh, this part, I can see where I'm showing up in this part. I can see where I'm showing up in this part. It was really a full process. And I was so surprised by the like emotions that showed up. But it was really cathartic, I think. Um, so I think just like the ability to own that, right? It was like, yep. Yeah. I mean, I was on my own journey, just like the the characters in the book. And I was grappling a little bit and trying to sort things out and going back and forth between like, oh, I don't know, do I want to look at it like this? Do I want to look at it like this? Like I was doing that in my own life. Um, and then getting to the end of the story and having it so um, clearly parallel what I what was like literally happening for me in my life at that time. I was like, oh my God. So the, the, the notion of like right, healing through story, saved by story, like this is, 
using fiction or nonfiction, but like using these stories to access and tap in to things that are happening inside and then healing or, or getting clarity or um, insight, whatever, whatever comes from the process was so evident and so unexpected. Like this is not at all what I thought was going to happen when we first started working together. Yeah. Yeah. And the really, um, I mean, I remember getting that text and just being like, yes, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm having a minor meltdown. Um, yeah. Cause you were just like, I, you know, like, I think the words that you use are like, I, like you saw yourself yeah. in the character, well, like was, you yeah. saw that yeah. this was that moment of eh, little bits and little bits, but like, nope, this is yeah. like that yeah. ownership. And um, what was crazy and synchronistic about the timing of that was that we were wrapping up, You Can't Make This Story Up, which was the collaborative book that I really <laughs> wanted you to be in from the beginning. Well, not from the beginning, because I didn't know you, but um, like starting last year, because I was, I, you know, I just saw this like alignment with your message and all the synchronicity of how we met. And I was like, her story should be in here but it just didn't work out. Like every time it was like, nope, not the right time. Nope, not that I kept getting a no. And then when you texted me, I had just gotten an email from the gentleman who was a psychologist um, who was going to write the foreword for you can't make this story up. And he was like, Amanda, I don't know what happened. I think that I can't do this. Like I'm overwhelmed. It's, uh, I don't think I can do it justice with the time frame that I have. And I, he, and these are those words, like, I don't know your model well enough. That was what he put in there. Mm -hmm. Like he would have to do too much um, research with me to try to identify all the things. So I'm looking at the email and I get your text. And I'm like, oh, shoot. <laughs> Do I know another therapist who understands the power of narrative therapy? <laughs> who knows the model? I mean, it was like this. It was this, this and you got to complete your story because I was really worried about, like, I didn't want to interrupt whatever healing process was happening with too much of the, too much of the meta reflection when you were still in the process. Like you were already doing that, but I didn't want you to feel like you were trying to seal up the deal to finish your chapter in this book, but it just happened at the perfect time. And you wrote that forward in, I think a week, it was ridiculous. It's so good. Well, you had, um, when you texted me, I think we talked about this last time. I got a text from you saying, Hey, like this happened. The, the gentleman who's going to write the forward is, is out. Do you do you think you know any therapists or psychologists who have an understanding of this or this or this that I can uh, talk to? And I, I li literally was like, oh, I'm sure I can think of somebody. But I literally, I, it did, I didn't get it. So I was like, well, I get mm, probably. And I'm like, oh, oh, do you mean me? <laughs> but I didn't get that at first. It just went like right over my head. And then I was like, oh, Oh, I would love to. I've never written one before. I, I don't know what to do, but it was, it did come fast. Yeah. Yeah. And it was all right there. I mean, it was that it was right. At, yeah. The right. energy of you can't make this story. If you were like in the soup of it, literally, it was perfect. Yeah. So thank you for doing that. Cause I'm so nice. glad that you got to tell the story in that book. And, um, yeah. Does anyone have any questions? I just feel like I can feel all of the energy. So I just have to like check in. Are there any questions? She's done such a good job. Let's just acknowledge how amazing of a job she has done at not giving away the details of her novel. I, I know I'm trying. I mean, you, you're you killing it when it comes to that. I love it. Like it's so good because, you know, you're not, you haven't given too much away anywhere. So, and so as somebody who has gotten to read just nearly every book that's come through here. I know nothing. It's like, this is so under wraps. I'm like, ah, give it to me. <laughs> How do you, I, I, 
I feel you, Teddy. I was in her cohort listening to the development of it all. And I was like, don't you need a reader yet? Can you just do a reader like per chapter as you go? <laughs> but and Teddy and I read so many of the books that come through. And she said she was almost done. I'm like, huh, I haven't I haven't been asked to read this one yet. So you've done a real job. Almost, <laughs> I almost wanted to ask Amanda. So is is Lori getting to read it? <laughs> <laughs> wow, we're about to start fighting over this book here in a second. Oh my goodness. That's a good sign right there. That's a good yeah, sign. Yeah, you hit something on the, on the head there. Can't wait to read it. <laughs> oh, that's coming. It's coming. Yeah. Not too much more. I appreciate all the, um, the support, like in Alyssa, the stuff with the cover and working on the content, the back content, like it's fun. It's, and you're right, that your last email was like, it's happening. That's what it is. Oh, yeah. happening. Do we all want a little sneak sneak peek? Yes, let's do yes. the sneak peek. I want to see where it's at now. Oh, that's exciting. Oh, that is so cool. So good, Alyssa. Wow. Isn't it um, stunning? All the all the audio only people are really sad right now, but you gotta yeah. come to YouTube and look at the Yeah. Oh my god, Alyssa, it looks so good. It's, it's exciting. Oh and god. the colors were just so you. And the stone in the back is now all filled in with the background. Yes. It looks so it's good. Perfect. Oh, it looks mm. so good. God, you did such a nice job on that. And people have no idea until they get to know your characters and get to know your story, just how much symbolism is on the mm -hmm. front cover, <laughs> you know? Yeah, it's true. Kidding. It's true. The, the, the uh, cover will tell the entire story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In a lot of ways. Uh -huh. Symbolically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you for the sneak peek, Alyssa. Yes. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm sure that people will probably want to know how to reach out to you and connect mm -hmm. with you. Is there a way that they can do that? Well, I have um, a website for my private practice. Uh, it's just, it's carlinpleasance.com, but there's a way to email me through there. I'm also on Facebook and Instagram, so. Yeah. yeah, we're going to have to put a page up there about the book at some point or maybe yeah. have its own website. Yeah. It's a whole new a whole new world you're building. I'm so excited about it. Yeah. We've even we've even talked about weaving the worlds together because now we have yeah. these different novels, these different bits of fiction happening. What if the characters all play together in some way? Oh my gosh, I love that idea. Wouldn't that be so fun? It would be like yeah. a saved by story special. It'll be like Saved by a story universe, like the Marvel yeah. universe. The Rabble, Rabble universe. Rabble universe. <laughs> Love it. Oh, well, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your story. And I mean, all of this amazing um, story and information. I really hope that people take this, um, this approach to caring for other humans mm -hmm. to heart because it's, to me, it's the most important thing that we that we figure out in this lifetime. It affects me the mental health space. It affects education. It affects um, it's social justice. Like if we could get this thing right, mm -hmm. so many of the world's problems would disappear. Mm -hmm. This one thing, just look at each other like human beings who need love mm -hmm. and connection. Like mm -hmm. what if it were that simple? So- it reminds me of that quote, mom, that um, when you were at university, one of your mentors or professors or whatever said, if you could look past the eyes of someone and into their soul, you'd want to worship them. Mm -hmm. And that's what I heard when I heard Carlin talking earlier about mm -hmm. that, for sure. So you hear that from inside her belly and remember it? Uh, no, it's in... <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and no, it's, it's coming up in our book. So yeah. she wrote that in there somewhere. <laughs> it was yeah. in one of the chapters somewhere and I... You know, it's just one of those quotes that really hits you Yeah, in all beautiful. the places. It's like, it needs to be on a wall and I don't know yes. why it isn't on, yeah. or is it on the wall? It should be on a wall. Somewhere. It should be on our wall. It's true. It's definitely on the wall of my heart. I remember, you know, when people say something to you and you can just feel it like, mm -hmm. like go into all of your cells. Mm -hmm. It's like a, it's like a dispensation, like a, a truth mm -hmm. bomb. 
And that was, you know, it was like, if I, if I take nothing else from this insane thing that I'm doing at this university of all the things, that was it. So yeah, that's why, that's why I had to work on this book. I was like, nope, we're not passing this off to anyone else. Amanda is going to figure out how to work on fiction. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you certainly did because you've been so like, I can't even, I don't even have words to describe how helpful you've been in getting getting this organized in a way that the message is clear. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. All right. Stay tuned. This book is going to be released feathers from the fire and, um, y'all you're going to love it. You're going to love it. So, um, thank you to our listeners and viewers for, uh, tuning into this episode of sips of story insanity. If you like what you heard, please consider subscribing leaving us a review and maybe even sharing what touched you about this particular episode that this is, you know, was it the synchronicity? Was it the idea of how we look at each other, changing each other? So mm -hmm. that's it. That's a wrap for today. See you next time. All right. Thank you. Bye.